Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Today I wanted to carry our teaching from Matthew, the 14th chapter, the 23rd verse. The Bible says Jesus had sent the multitudes away and he went up into a mountain, the Bible says, apart to pray. And when the evening was come, the Bible says there he was alone. But the sheep, the Bible says, was now in the midst of the sea. Of course, there were disciples in there and tossed with the waves for the wind was contrary. And the Bible says, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went and to them, his disciples walking on the sea. And the Bible says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, the Bible says they were troubled saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. And the Bible says, but straight away, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. The Bible says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on water. And Jesus said to Peter, come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. The Bible says he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And the Bible says, and when they were coming to the sheep, the Bible says, the wind ceased wind ceased. The wind ceased. Now, this is a very common scripture, of course, when it comes to believers. For those of us who have been in the faith for quite some time, you've heard the story of Peter. And there are many, of course, revelations around this experience. And some have taught on Peter walking on water, the power walk on water, which is a revelation. Some have spoken of his thinking, which is also a revelation. There's many aspects you could look at when you're looking at this particular story. I have in the past actually preached a sermon uh, in this very scripture, although today I'm going to take another look again on that context to show us something so beautiful, to show us something so revealing about this mystery of faith. Because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But many of us do not, for a moment, understand how does this faith work? How do we make our faith work? You know, when we're talking about the armor of God, faith is a shield, all right? It's a shield, and like he says, as you put on the shield of faith, the Bible says that you might be able to quench the fairy darts of the evil one, you know. It's a shield. Faith is a shield. So, yes, the devil shall send in, uh, you know, darts. He'll send attacks. Attacks will come to you. They happen to everybody in the world. Nobody in the world has not been attacked by the devil. But it's how then you have fortified yourself and build a shield of faith, you know, around you, around your family, around your business, around your ministry. And we find that in the body of Christ today, uh, many Christians are struggling when it comes to the idea of faith. Some have loosely, you know, believed it. Some have disqualified certain elements of it, you know, to provide for the elements that are easily explainable in their realm of reason and thought. Some, it's just an idea, you know. Some, it's a confusing one, you know. How do we build our faith? How do we build this shield that indeed when the darts of the evil one come, fairy to us, we have a way, you know, to quench them, we have a way, you know, to guard, to protect, you know, because when you learn how to function in faith, it means you'll keep your body, you'll keep your life, you'll keep your marriage, you'll keep your business, you'll keep your career, you'll keep your children, you'll keep your ministry, everything that touches you, you know, is kept, okay? So, in this instance, we see uh, Jesus has gone to a mountain of prayer, the disciples go into a sheep, 
and you know that night the winds come you know boisterous and the ship is tossed to and fro the winds are much and of course it was in the fourth hour which is probably about 3 a.m 4 a.m about that time of the night and then the disciples are afraid you know what are we going to do they are troubled in their spirits but then jesus appears to them walking on water the scriptures say they're scared you know, is this a ghost to some, you know? And they say, no, I'm the one. And so Peter is like, Lord, if it be, he bid me to come. And Jesus tells Peter, come. And on that word, on the word come, you know, Peter receives the power, but the waters as well, you know, uphold this man. And then he starts walking on water, you know? And the Bible says, and when he started to walk on water, he saw the winds boisterous. The Amplified says he perceived, you know, and felt the strong wind, all right? perceived and felt the strong wind he perceived and felt the strong wind you know he saw with his physical eyes he observed with the eyes of the flesh the greek would say he observed with the eye of the flesh you know and then he saw the winds were boisterous and you know everything was shaking and when he sees how strong the wind is and how the waves and torrents are shaking and moving. The Bible says he started to sink. And of course, we say, oh, when he looked at the winds, he began to sink. Yes. You know, that's a general thought and understanding. Of course, I believe all of us understand that. But I wanted to touch the whole idea around the wind. Because what we ignore, uh, most importantly, in this text tonight, is the Bible says when Jesus reaches out his hand to get a hold of Peter, tells him, oh, from whence did thou doubt, okay? And immediately he stretched forth his hands and caught him, and both of them walk unto the sheep. And when they go to the sheep, the Bible says, the wind ceased immediately. The moment Jesus carries Peter and puts him on the boat, the Bible says, the wind ceased. That's why I really want to throw emphasis on the 32nd verse. What time did this wind begin when the waves started being tossed to and fro? All right? And before Jesus comes on the scene, what were the disciples thinking when the winds were tossing to and fro? When Jesus tells Peter, come, and Peter walks on water, and then Peter looks, you know, at these winds with his physical eye, he perceives and felt the wind in the physical senses. So when the Bible says when he saw the winds, the connotation there is, is the physical sense. When his physical senses perceived that this is actually wind and he could feel the wind, the strong wind, you know, the Bible says he began to sink. And Jesus asked him, from where did you doubt? And they walked to the ship and the wind ceases, meaning this wind was deliberate was deliberate. The scriptures don't tell us that Jesus commanded that wind to cease. In this instance, the wind ceased. Jesus did not command it to cease. It's not written anywhere that Jesus commanded the sea to come down. No. The wind just ceased. Stopped operation. Okay? So, of course, you'll ask, if this Jesus would calm the sea, by a word, we've had experiences before in Scripture, if I'll open for you in Mark chapter 4, verses 37. It gives us of a time where a great storm of wind arises, and the waves were beating into the sheep, and so it was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the sheep. Jesus was under there, asleep on a pillow. And the Bible tells us, and when they awake him, they said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And the Bible says, And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And the Bible says, and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? And the Bible says, how is it that you have no faith? And the Bible says, he said unto them, why are you so fearful? And they feared exceedingly. The Bible says, and said to one another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? He had the power to seize the wind. He had the power to command the wind to be still. And the sea would be still immediately. So the wind has begun. Why in this event of Peter did he not walk on the water, make the wind cease? 
okay? When he makes the wind seize, then Peter can say, if, you know, it be you bid me to come, and Peter will walk on water. Are you hearing me? Because the one thing we see that makes Peter sink was his observation of the wind. It was the feeling of the strong wind. When he saw the winds boisterous, when his physical eye perceived it and he could feel it, when his senses were activated toward the wind, he began to sink. So what if the water was calm? Maybe, just maybe, Peter would have walked to our master and back without a problem because, as we see, by the time Peter starts to sink, he had already walked certain steps on water, actually. He had started walking on water. The Bible says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So there were steps earlier of Peter walking on water. If that water was calm, okay, Peter would have walked with a Christ and back for as long as he wanted based on that faith. But now we see another element, you know, of the wind and God knowing the heart of Peter, he knew that with this, Peter would doubt. And so the wind is activated. Okay, God let the wind be. He let the wind be. All right? And now we see that Jesus does not rebuke the wind, but he walks through this man to save him from whence did thou doubt? At what point did your faith give up? Okay? And the moment they get to the ship, the wind ceases. The wind ceases. The wind ceases. Now, some people have not understood what it means for our faith to be tried. The trial of your faith. What it means for our faith to be tried. Now, when we go to scripture, the Bible says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6, if you will read from the Amplified Version. He says, you should be exceedingly glad on this, the Bible says, account. Though now for a little while you may be distressed, he says, by trials and suffer temptations, the Bible says, so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. The genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, the Bible says, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, the Bible says, which is tested and purified by fire. The Bible says, this proving, the Bible says, of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Bible says, the anointed one is revealed. Okay? Now, I want to talk about the trial of our faith. The trial of our faith. Now, we're not talking about the man who is ready to believe God to walk on water. We're talking about those other things that come when the man is walking on water. This sermon is not for those who stay in the ship. What I'm preaching tonight is not for people who even fear to walk on water, who even fear to take God at his word and say, if you be the son of God, bid me to come. I'm talking about some of you who are watching me right now, listening in, who have tried to exercise faith in a particular area and have achieved a certain success which would, you know, equal to these few steps that Peter walks on water before his faith is tried by the winds. You're the kind I'm trying to talk about, okay? Because when Peter is trying to express this faith, he expresses the preciousness of faith. Faith is a very precious element. It's a very precious life toward God. The Bible speaks also in Peter somewhere, it speaks of how we have obtained like precious faith like precious faith the word therefore precious is esteemed the word therefore precious is honored okay god honors faith god respects a man who believes him so when the bible says that the lord honoreth his servants he doesn't then honor a man because he has placed an anointing on his life no he honors a man because that man has responded to what god has placed on him Okay? So in Second Peter, he speaks of how Simon Peter, the servant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and to them that have obtained with us through the righteousness of God, that precious faith, that precious faith. Faith is precious. Faith is precious. Toward God, faith is honorable. Some of you need to see, you know, by the eyes of the Spirit, what it means to God 
when you make the decision to believe him. Okay? Now, some stay in the boat, ah, no, they don't want to risk praying for the sick. What if the sick don't get healed? They don't want to risk laying hands on the blind. What if the blind don't see? They don't want to risk doing those multi-billion dollar businesses, you know? What if this guy and work? You know, they don't want to risk. They want to believe, you know, in the boat. They want to stay safe in the boat, you know? And sometimes whatever is staying them in the boat is actually fear, all right? And then you have a group of people who are ready to move who are ready to walk on water, who are ready, you know, to work out, you know, their faith, who are ready to risk and say, God, I know television stations are watching me across the world, but your word has said that if you lay hands on the sick, they shall be healed. And that man walks to a man of the wheelchair or he walks to a blind man or he sends out his faith in the word in the air and God honors that. I tell people, faith is precious. Faith is not just that one thing God has put there for you to try when you're in trouble and then, you know, every time a person believes, your father in heaven is like, wow, I honor that. I honor that. So our faith is honored by God. So when the Bible says that he honors his servants, the part of us that he honors is the part that we are ready to put our trust and lean our entire personality on him on him if you will forget anything never forget that that it is precious i tell people you'd rather fail trying out what you know pleases god all right you'd rather be ashamed trying to do what you know pleases god than staying static in what you know displeases god faith is pleasurable before god faith is esteemed before god faith is honored before God. That is why there are people who see multiple miracles every time they stand on the pulpit to proclaim this God and put him out there for men to see. He said he will never put you to shame. He will never put you to shame. It is not the way of God to see us to shame. So if you say, oh, but I tried and things did not work, thank you, at least you took that to three steps outside the boat. And I tell people, exercise yourself in the dealings of always doing things that are outside your simple thinking, your simple reasoning. It's called stretching your faith. It's a life that you cultivate to stretch your faith. It's a life you cultivate to stretch your faith. All right? And so when you understand how the trial of our faith, you know, the Bible says to God, which is more precious, and gold when you understand that the end of this trial is that you might be found and to praise and honor again the word honor has come and glory at the appearing of christ there's an honor god wants to elevate on you okay you understand why the winds come when you're walking on water you learn to explain to anybody else around you why there are winds when you're walking on water. I'm talking of those moments when you are living in a miracle moment, but something seems to be setting itself against the course of what you are at that particular point activated into the face to do and you're actually on the run already. Again, I repeat, I'm not talking about people who are in the boat, who stay in the ship. I wish one disciple turned to Jesus and said, me too. He would tell him, come also. Me too. He'll tell them all come, you know. But there are some, even when they see Peter making the first two steps before he observes the wind, they're still observing to see whether this man is sinking. You know, there are people who just live to observe men of faith working. You know, <laughs> they just live to observe men of faith working. All right? And their mind is, what if it fails? Or it could fail. All right? And what if Peter had walked seven steps and sunk? There are certain men in that boat who would be teaching on the wisdom of how not to go out, you know, when your faith is not fully loaded. And I understand that wisdom. I respect it to a certain extent. Are you hearing me? But toward God, it was more honorable for a man to make seven right steps in faith and the man who stays on the boat. That is why, because of that honor, he would not let this man sink, even in the midst of his unbelief. 
God is saying, if you try out this and start walking those steps, the honor he attributes to you, the glory that is attributed to you for having made that first step out of the boat. Are you hearing me? There is no way the Son of God would let you sink when you say, help me. I'm stuck here, but I've made the progress. I've made the five steps. Lord, look at this. Help me. His hand will always reach out because there is no way the story would end in you sinking when you've made seven, eight steps and your hand was still reaching out for help toward him. Unless you say, ah, I'm sinking, but I don't need your help. That's another thing. Now, the wisdom would be, again, if we're teaching rightly, that when you make those steps and you feel like you're sinking, ask for help toward God. That's more reasonable. But I don't like the wisdom that teaches men to stay in the boat because you could only make seven steps on the water. Why? Because if you've made those seven steps, there is a hand that is ready to help you to make your eighth and ninth and tenth. What people don't know is after that, when Jesus reaches out to Peter, what happens? Obviously, they have to make it back to the ship, but on water. Hello? The progress still continues for the man who is ready. Okay? So I've seen in life that when we are ready to walk out and we have left the boat and we've made those five, six steps, all right? Winds will come. Okay? Winds will come. That was not the moment for the Son of God to stop this boisterous wind. No, because the Son of God was looking to the perfection of the faith of this man who has made these steps on the water. Again, the wind could only be felt by the man walking on the water, not the people on the boat. Of course, they knew the wind was there, but there was a certain confidence that they had on the boat and the ship that they were on. Of course, the insecurity on the man walking on water without anything is standing under. All right? Of course, it was there. It was a bit more amplified than the folk who were seated in the boat. So you would see that, again, the winds are felt most. All right? The boisterousness of these winds is felt most by the man who has made the seven or eight steps. And people, kind of Christians, observe that and they start, hmm, you see, we knew he was not going to make it. What did you know? What do you know? What are you even teaching when you have never stood underwater? When you have never made one step? And what would you even teach? That's why I tell believers, even when you're learning from men of God, know who you learn from. Paul told Timothy, not forgetting from whom thou hast learned these things from. Not everybody teaches you faith. If a man has never done a miracle, how can he teach you about faith? If a man has never believed God for finances and had, you know, a testimony of those finances, how can he teach you about faith? How can he teach you about faith in finances? It's not possible. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. So, sometimes again we have to assess who really teaches us. Who really teaches us? Paul says, I will not speak of the things said which Christ has wrought by me or in me that I might make the Gentiles obedient both in word and deed. All right? We, we, we have a bunch of believers who have, you know, cultivated a life of sitting on the boat and, you know, criticizing those who are making a step. Those who are making a step of the sheep. They're making a step of faith. But I tell you something, if you are one of those observers, you know, leave that camp. Get out of that mentality of scorning at those who have chosen to believe God. Because whether you want it or not, they are actually trying to please God with their works. Of course, they know, you know, he's pleased with them through the sacrifice of Christ. Of course, we all know God is pleased in us through the sacrifice of Christ. All right? But... There's that place where you want to please with your works, all right? All faith, right? All faith, the works of faith. I'm not talking about works and to faith. I'm talking about the works of faith, all right? Those which James says faith without works is dead, all right? Faith without works is dead. It is dead, all right? It's because we have a group of folk who when they get into the faith, they don't know how to reconcile 
faith and grace. They don't know how to balance faith and grace. You know, they stay very passive in affairs where they're supposed to be acting out in the way of the Spirit, in the name of, no, if I'm under grace, I just need to rest. And some of those things God is saying, you have to take a step of faith because every step of faith, then comes grace. Right? Then comes grace. Grace is available where faith is. You know? And faith is available where grace is. You see? Those two should never be confused. And that's why I tell people, the New Testament church should not struggle to balance grace and the law. No. It should be teaching on the balance of faith and grace. The action that comes in the rest. All right? Am I working to please God? Or am I working because I please Him and therefore my works of faith are to further justify the pleasing He has of me? All right? He is pleased of me and that of a sudden I know. And then I try to do these works of faith that I might please him in my works, all right, even as he is pleased of me in Christ, all right? Like the sort of to be holy even as you are holy. You understand what I'm saying? So now we have the instance then of when we make these steps, you know, certain wins, God lets, God lets, all right? And interestingly, it doesn't mean that those winds don't attack men in sheep. It only means that when that kind of wind finds you in the sheep <laughs> and Christ is not there, chances are you might sink in that very sheep. It can, you know, be wrecked and people sink. You understand what I'm saying? So the winds were attacking both the people in the sheep and the man walking on the water although it was most perceived and felt by the man walking on water. And God let that wind because he will let certain winds come when you make a certain step on the water. It doesn't mean that those winds do not come to people on the ship. It only means that when they are on the ship, they sometimes look at the defense of that ship. They put their trust in something else except God. But when you are walking on water, you realize you have no sheep around you. So again, it just delves you more into deeper trust for the Lord than the sheep that you sit on. And that's a very good place to be if your faith should be perfected. So he has spoken about the trial of our faith. It is precious. Okay. And these winds could represent many things. They could represent that step of faith you took to enter the business and the business started working two, three, four, five, six months, okay? And then, you know, an event happened. They closed shops like this period of lockdown and curfew. And some of you, when the shops open, you're actually going to be operating in minuses or on zero capital, all right? Those are wins. But you have run this business for one, two, three years, and it was okay. And for some, they will begin again that work and close for days. For some, they will never go back to that work again. The business will die forever. But there are people, like those that are watching me this hour, who whether you're going to begin that business in minus, or whether you're going to begin that business with a bank loan that has already accrued interest, you're still going to walk on that water. If you stretch out your hand and say, Father, help me, there is a hand of God that is willing to help you out. And whether you want it or not, at the end of the day, it shall be written of you that you walked on that water back with our master and that men stayed on the sheep. Men stayed on the sheep. That is the Peter who understands the preciousness of faith. <laughs> the other disciples, yeah, they can call it faith. But when it comes to Peter, he says, we have obtained like precious faith all right when it comes to peter he speaks of the trial of your faith which is more precious peter understands the preciousness of faith more than gold that perishes more than the money that you know has an end more than you know all these things because when you're talking about gold in that context he's talking about the other things you might put your trust into you know because gold you know, was sort of a value that men would put trust into. If you had gold, you know, you, you did not worry, you know, about finances. You did not worry about accessing many of the things that people need, okay? And God tells you, look, gold is precious, but when it comes to your faith, it is way much more, he says, much more precious than gold that perishes. 
right? Though it be tried with fire, the Bible says he's saying, I'm trying to test this faith, burn it to the place where at the end of the day it will be found unto you, praise, okay? People will testify of what God is doing in your life. To and honor, God will honor you, but God cannot honor you and men do not honor you. And glory at the appearing of Christ. I tell people, when men honor you without the honor of God, that is superficial, it is political. You know, it can be spent with its own doing. But I tell people, but if God honors you, if God honors you and the honor of men on your life begins from the honor God has to it. I'm not talking about men of God who create, you know, an honor around themselves, you know, who mystify themselves so they will be honored. No, I'm talking about the kind of honor God puts on you, that even without you showing it or you seeking it or you teaching it or you you know trying to invite it it will come you know by the miracles people will see on your life all right by the power of god that people will see on your life all right somebody sees a miracle and they're like if god can do this kind of thing through the faith of this man then i will honor this man as i honor the god in that man Honor is not worship, it's different. I will esteem this man, you know, because he has been honored by God, you know. Because when God reacts to a man's prayer, he's honoring that man. He's honoring that man. So God has allowed and will allow certain winds to come. We are preachers of the gospel, you know. Ministry can run straight. And then tomorrow a wind comes, you know, through media. A wind comes through, you know, folk you pastor, wind comes, you know, through things in life and they test you and some give up and some that's the end of their ministry and some that's the end of their progress and some that's the, no, but you see, a man of God heals a sick person and after healing that sick person, tomorrow he wakes up and he's suffering of the thing he healed a man of, you know, and those things, you know, and winds come and they come and test, you know, physician, huh? You heal yourself, you understand? And, and you're like, huh? You know, you believe in God for some bigger. You make your steps on the water, but the winds come. The winds come. Some of you, the things that carry winds now are things you believed God for, and you can attest that these things have made a sort of progress that only God would have made. They were impossible by human mathematics, by human geometry, by human science and biology for them to be working. When you get in that kind of situation, always have the wisdom to design when you see certain winds that are not supposed to be rebuked by the Christ but are there for the testation and trial of your faith. There are winds that are supposed to be rebuked and God will always give you the wisdom to know that this wind is for rebuke. But this particular wind is for the trial of your faith. Fix your eyes particularly on this water. Fix your eyes on the word that told you come. If you get to a point where it is too much, ask for help. His hand will come out to help you, but ignore that wind because the moment you fulfill your full circle and get back, you know, to the sheep, you realize that the wind will cease. It will cease because it was never about the wind. It was always about the trial of your faith. Now, let me show you a mystery here, very interestingly. When the Bible says that the wind ceased, you know, in verses 32, when they went into the ship, the wind ceased. The Greek word there for ceased is kapadzo. Kapadzo. And what does kapadzo mean? It means to grow weary or tired. Okay? In other words, the wind grew weary or tired. The wind got to a point where it seized its violence and raging because it got weary and got tired. I told people, you can tire the devil out. You can frustrate the devil until he's tired. He cannot hold on forever if you know how to fight. If you know how to fight. And God wants to fortify your faith to a level where the devil knows if he's attacking, he knows who he's attacking. If he launches out, he knows what he's opening fire onto. You see, the devils come to men and tell them, listen, Paul, we know. Jesus, we know. Why do they say we know Paul? Why do they say we know? They know. They know the headache. 
that these men have given them. They know how much fiery they are. They know, you know, how much tiring they can be. They know how much dangerous these men are to be attacked. You understand what I'm saying? You have to cultivate a faith where even the devil fears to attack you. Even devils fear to attack you. Evil spirits fear to come near you. They're the ones that go back and tell the reporter and say, hey, 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 there is a man called, there is a woman called, you know? And so when those conversations start moving, when those conversations start moving, you know, in the Hades, eh, in hell, you know, they start to hear rumors. Even those that have not attacked start saying, huh? You know, this demon was telling us of some fellow in Uganda called Lubega Grace, or your name, you can put your name, or certain a woman ex in Mexico or Dubai or Ghana or France or Malaysia. You see, you have to get to a point, you know, where you know how to cultivate a life of it. And that's what God is trying to do. I allow these winds, all right, to help you carry through these things to get to a point where even when the winds come, even when you can perceive and feel the pain, okay, you know how to still stay walking afloat. If you learn to do that, the Bible says the moment you carry your course through for that season, the Bible says the wind will cease. The wind will grow weary or tired. You can tire the devil out. You can tire the principalities out. You can tire the rulers out. You can tire spirits of wickedness out. But yet by the time they are tired, you're actually the most refreshed. Your course is through, you know, your principle is done. Your vision is achieved. Your dream is now in manifestation. I tell people you can tire the devil out. That's what happened to the wind. The wind seized. The wind got tired. It got to a point where it was too much. Are you hearing me? It got to a point where it says, uh-uh, I think this is not something I can handle. I tell people whatsoever can come your way, if the Lord has seen it come and he has let it come, you must understand that there is an ability in you innately to defeat it. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Maybe it has come to you because you can handle it. He says, no temptation that has befallen us save that which is common and to man. Save that which is common and to man. It is not new. You might be in a situation, sometimes people go through things and you feel like you're alone. But there are brethren across the world, like Thessalonians says, that have gone through the same trials and have overcome them. So it says, for there is no temptation that has befallen you, save that which is common to man. But about this, but God is faithful. He says, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above which you are able to bear? That means we are tested on our abilities. We are tested on our abilities, not in abilities. We are tested on our sufficiency in God, not our insufficiency as men. Whatever is attacking you is a proof of how much power is in you, how much ability is in you. See, he says, God will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. He says, but he will with the temptation, with that particular wind, with that particular trial. He will also, the Bible says, make a way for you to escape. The Bible says that you may be able to bear it. If you're listening to me, I want you to say, in the name of Jesus, I can withstand anything that comes to me. Because by the time it comes to me, Christ knows I'm able to bear. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. That is why when Peter is talking about the trial of your faith, he says, though there are trials, there are temptations, there are testations, he says, but you all take it with joy. You take it with joy. Peter, when he's talking about that experience of the trial of our faith, he says this particular experience of our lives, we might be tested, you know, you might be tried, you might go through things that test you beyond, all right? But when Peter's talking about it in the Amplified, he says you should be exceedingly glad you should be exceedingly glad. He says you should be exceedingly glad on this account. You should be. He says in verse 6, right? First Peter uh, 1 Peter six. He says you should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and temptations. But he says you should be. He's not saying you try to be, you know, happy. No. He says you should, you should, you should be happy. 
when you see winds, when you see things, signs that continue coming in your body even when you believe God for healing, you just clap your hands and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Because these signs that are continuing on my body, they are not there because I'm not healed. No, they are there because you are perfecting my faith. And when they are gone, because they will grow weary, they will get tired, the testimony is going to be bigger. I'm going to count it all by joy and you're going to honor you know, me more as my faith is being tried and I'm applied to looking unto you, which is the author and finisher of my faith. I'm talking of people who go through things and they say, wow, all is okay. I'm happy. Things are working out great. Even when you're in, you know, you have nothing. Even when you have no money on your account, but you're saying, no, 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 no. I'm glad exceedingly because there's something working out better. God cannot test your faith if he's not taking you to your next level. But you have to get to a point where you can tire out the devil, where you can give him a bloody nose in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In James 4, 7, he says, submit yourselves, okay, and to God. In other words, put yourself under the obedience of the word. Align yourself to the truth acknowledged in God. Submit yourself to his will. He says, submit yourself therefore to God. And the next verse says, resist the devil. Some people say, resist the devil and he shall see. But what comes before? Submit yourself unto truth. Submit yourself unto God's word. Submit yourself in obedience to what he has said because you read it, it is so, it is true, it doesn't matter what you see outside. He says, now when you have done that, then resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. The Greek word therefore, he will flee, is fugo. The Greek word therefore, he will flee from you, is Fugo. And fugo means to seek safety by flight or to escape safely out of danger. To seek safety by flight or to escape and run as one running away from danger. He will flee from you. That means you can become so dangerous to the devil. So dangerous to hell. So dangerous to the demons. So dangerous to evil spirits. So dangerous to principalities and powers and rulers. So dangerous. You have to get to a point where you are so dangerous. He did not say flee from the devil. He did not say avoid the devil. He said resist the devil. Once you have aligned yourself to the principle of faith and the shield is there, all right, to quench the fiery dust, he says resist the devil. And he says when you resist the devil, the Bible says he will flee from you as one running away in flight for safety or running to escape danger. <laughs> Glory to God to escape danger. To escape danger. So, who is dangerous? You know, you have believers who say, Oh, you know, the devil is dangerous. Listen, you are dangerous. Yeah, the devil is dangerous to those who don't know who they are in God. But we want to get to a point where you can look at the devil straight in the eye and tell him, I am dangerous. Dangerous. I have shared an experience where one time I went uh, in a meeting and I found a bunch of believers that were casting out devils out of a child. And so I was supposed to be preaching it was about 4 a.m. And so I enter the church and I find this group of elders, 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 you know, surrounding this girl. One has put a Bible on her head <laughs> and they're casting, go, 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 get out, get out. And they're casting this devil out of this girl. And, you know, she's doing all this drama, all this theatrics and all these things and all these devils in her. You know, they're looking, abusing, fighting, doing this, you know, aggressive and all doing that. The devils were doing all that kind of nonsense. And I'm supposed to be preaching after. So when I come in, I said, so how long have you been praying for? I said, about two hours or so. He said, okay, can I do it? Yes. So I told these boys, let's carry her out. So the boys carry her out. And when they did, I remember looking straight into this young girl's eyes and I could see the devils that were afflicting her. And I remember I looked at them straight in the eye and I said, you devils, the reason why I've gotten you out from the front is because you are pulling attention in the place where men are supposed to be worshipping God. And I told the devil now I am in no mood to scream for hours and minutes for you to leave. Go now. And the demons in the girl said, okay and they left her 
immediately she returned to sanity. So they see me take a girl two minutes out and then she's back sober, she's seated on a chair and she's attending service and nothing, you know, threw tantrum on her again the whole night all through and she was free and delivered. Okay, what's the difference? Because I know who I am and what I have in God and what he has put in my spirit. You have to get to a level where you can even cut a wire for the devil and tell him, hey, I'm not in the mood, you're not going to pull this. Sometimes we can take our time if we are just bored and we just want to burn them more. But you see, there comes a time where when you understand the power latent in your spirit as a believer, you even have the opportunity to tell the devil, you know what, I am not in the mood. And they'll say, oh, that fellow does not joke and they'll flee immediately. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he shall flee from you for safety because it's not safe when he's with you. He's not safe in your area. Are you hearing me? He will run out of flight as one who is in danger. That means some devils will even get to a point of saying, ah, don't send me to that man. Don't send me. When Jesus walks to this fellow with legion, they say, oh, son of God, what dost thou want us with us? No, it's not that it's not yet the hour. We know it's not yet the time for our judgment. Why do you come here to torment us? He had not done anything. But the fact that they beheld him, the Bible says they cried out. They cried out. He says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of God? He says, is that thou come here to torment us before the time? Don't you think we know our time? We know the time. There's an end time that when the judgment comes, leave us alone. They look at Jesus and they already look at a tormentor before he has said or done anything. They started crying. When you understand that mystery, when you come near people with devils, they'll start crying before you see anything. Why? Because they have a record of you. I'll never forget one overnight, I went and I was casting out devils and a spirit spoke in a woman and asked me, you have found us here also? Okay, they spoke in the local language, Luganda, and said, even here, you have found us here also? I said, hey, why did I first meet you? You know, it was so funny. It was so funny. Meaning these devils, I think I'd met them somewhere in a certain individual, probably. And this was the second time now I find them in another house. And now they're disturbed that I chased them out of one house, an individual, and I found them in a, that demons that are walking in the world. They're just looking for a place to rest. They find the place they were built out of and it's fortified with the word. You know, they go look for another place. They're moving in dry places looking for a place to rest. And now they sit on some other people. So I met a spirit that it explained that by history we had met before and had cast it out. So he says, you've also met me here also, you know. And I told him, no, I'm not in the mood to talk with you or anything. Get out. So it screamed and the woman fell down and, you know, screamed and rolled on the floor and it was out to the glory of God. He has given us power above all principalities, above all rulers, above all spirits of wickedness, above all we are seated in Christ far above. So, some of us are going through a trial of faith, and you will have those moments where your faith is tried. When you carry the wisdom to know that God is trying to, you know, purge you, purify your faith, regardless of what is happening, it's the moment where you become exceedingly glad, because then you carry the anticipation. If you, God, have considered that my faith, you know, should be tried, then you're taking me to the next level. Every time you see wings, celebrate your next level. By the time Peter went into that boat, he was on another level. He understands the preciousness of faith. Do you? So I want you to open your mouth right now and thank God for precious faith. Father, we thank you for precious faith. Just open your mouth wherever you are. Thank you for precious faith. Father, we thank you for precious faith. We thank you for precious faith. We thank you for precious faith. Oh, Saraba Baba Kosa Katala Payere Bakura Baba. Oh, Yaraba Kose Remando Robo Sakatala Pa. We thank you for precious faith, oh God. We thank you because we are being elevated every other day. We thank you because your word is coming through right now and it is perfecting us in this mystery of faith. Oh, Rabba Zakatala Payala Katala Payakata. Oh, Sarabba Baba Kozele Mando Robo Zeke Brakatala Pa. Roko Talaba Yehozo Lobo Kobrakatala Makozele Pa. Robo Zike Telepaya Rabba Kosala Mando Robo Zele Pa. 
My God, I pray for that man. I pray for that woman that left that boat and chose to believe you in their marriage and chose to believe you in their ministry and chose to believe you with their children and chose to believe you in their career and chose to believe you in their education and chose to believe you in their business and chose to believe you. Some even left certain faiths and believed salvation and they've been scoffed at and abused and say you're stupid, you're foolish since you entered salvation and you've been in that church and ministry nothing is happening on your life i decree and i declare in the mighty name of jesus that of those that have tested you know the power of the first six four seven steps on water and god for those that are in the middle of the crisis because they believed you to walk out of that ship god i pray that may you help them i decree and i declare that divine help is coming the hand of the lord is being extended right now in the name of jesus for somebody's marriage for somebody's business for somebody's ministry for somebody's health in the mighty name of jesus for somebody's career for a pastor's church a pastor's ministry a believer's life right now in the name of jesus christ somebody's health i see that the hand of God is able. It is stretching out. He says, I see what you did. I see the steps you did because of your faith. I see the seeds you sowed because of your faith. Those steps you walked onto when you gave him when you did not have much. Those steps of faith that you took in the name of Jesus Christ when you applied yourself to serve even when the ability to serve was not present. When you woke up and walked and, and ditched you know, the worldly wisdom and believed God for his word. He says, I see your steps of application of faith. And this father kept you alive in your health, in your business, in your ministry. And of course, turbulences are here, trials are here, winds, you know, are thrown to and fro boisterous. I decree and I declare that the help of God is come. The hand of God is reaching out in the name of Jesus. It is touching, it is saving, it is delivering, it is upholding, it is feeling. I feel the anointing of God right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I see the anointing that makes the impossible possible. I see the anointing that raises valleys and flattens uh, mountains. I see the anointing that will help men vaunt through high fences. I see the anointing in the mighty name of Jesus that will make you walk through troops. I see the anointing that settles. I see the anointing that satisfies. I see the anointing that heals. I see the anointing that sets free. I see the anointing that delivers. I see the anointing of miracles, signs and wonders. I see the anointing in the mighty name of Jesus of double, of triple, of quadruple, of a hundredfold in the name of Jesus. Christ. I see the anointing of multiplication. I see the anointing of increase. I see the anointing of glory. I see the anointing of favor. It is resting in your life. It's resting in your family. It's resting on your business. It's resting in your career. It's resting on your ministry. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, it's resting on your vision. It's resting on your dreams. It's resting on your affairs, the affairs of your life. It's resting on your household. In the mighty name of Jesus, it's resting on your children. In the name of Jesus, it's resting on your spouse, your husband, your wife. It's resting in the mighty name of Jesus. It's resting in the mighty name of Jesus. I see the power of restoration. I see God restore things that were impossible to restore. I see the hand of God reaching out to remembrance. Some of you, you're getting your jobs back. Some of you in this very period, you're going to be called with a better offer. You're going to be called with a better job. You're going to be called with a better deal. You're going to be called in the name of Jesus Christ with a better story in the mighty name of Jesus. Greater news is coming for you this year than you have ever before. Like God spoke that this is a year of restoration. It is a year where God is going to redeem things. We decree and we declare that may your staff be redeemed. May things touching you be redeemed. May your ministries be redeemed. May your homes be redeemed. May your children be redeemed. May your health be redeemed. Even as you are redeemed in Christ by the Spirit. I decree and I declare that great things await you. I see God reconstruct, rebuild, restore, realign, restore 
resuscitate, rejuvenate. I declare and I declare that great things come your way and there is nothing the devil can do. I thank God that you are resisting. I thank God that the devil is fleeing away from you because you have become a danger. I thank God that the devil has grown weary and tired of attacking. I declare and I declare in the name of Jesus that you are entering a season where the devil's things are going to flee. The evil stuff is going to flee far away from you as one running to safety away from you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed and believed. Amen. Healing has taken place. Cancer is healed. HIV is healed. COVID is healed. In Jesus' name. All manner of disease is healed. All manner of disease is healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. Receive your healing. I don't need to mention what. Just receive your healing. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And for those of you who have heard me and you feel you say, I think I need that Jesus. Because it's one thing to be on the ship. It's, it's one thing to be an unbeliever. Because if the winds come and you cannot call on God, what would you do? Okay. So I want to give you an opportunity to receive this man who died for you, shed his blood for you. He became the propitiation of your sins that you might have life and light to the fullest. Repeat these words after me if you're there. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the integrity of your story. Thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. And now tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior and born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.